Hey everybody, it is Lisa from Not That Hard to Home School and I'm here with Gina and we are your admin team and so we're excited to come and talk to you today. We've had several questions on, um, on the groups about how to teach your kids how to learn or what we would focus on to teach our kids how to learn. So we want to share with you a really simple tool that we've both used in our homeschool with our nine kids collectively. Wow, we have, we have nine kids together. That's crazy. Well, you have 10 now. I mean, you have five now. So um, 10 kids collectively. And um, this tool you can use across grade levels or subject matters is a great way to homeschool all your kids together, even if they're different ages and all that kind of stuff. So Gina, so glad you're here with me. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're kind of one of the one of the big faces behind the groups too. So you guys have seen Gina's name quite a bit. Um, you might recognize this, this teaching technique by the term, the five common topics. And um, I, I heard about it years ago. Um, and I thought it was really interesting because that's what we did a lot of the a lot of our homeschooling is we use the five common topics. But um, this goes way back to I think Aristotle, where he grouped them all together. And we have a little ebook about it. But you didn't, and and it's really hot in classical circles. The five common topics in the five canons of rhetoric. rhetoric. <clears throat> if you've homeschooled classically, you've probably heard those terms. Gina didn't. You didn't really take that that path as you homeschool, did you? Like, not directly, but sort of. <laughs> no, no, we didn't really adopt a classical model um, as a whole, but we definitely ended up inadvertently picking up some of the classical model because it worked really well with the principal approach model, which is the primary or foundational model I used in my homeschooling. And um, so those five common topics that are what we call the five common topics we were using as a method to teach our kids to um, think and reason mm -hmm. through any topic, any subject. And principal approach just took it one step further, I would say, in that we looked at what um, scripture had to say on a subject to align our worldview. Yeah. That would be that would be the primary difference. But no, these are they're almost like magic when you think about them. Yeah. <laughs> They are. They're so simple. I the other thing that I've been really thinking about the five common topics the last couple weeks about is we still have a, a kiddo in college and she's really running up against other kids who don't start with definitions. She just did a project where they had to do a speech and debate. And she did that through high school where they always start with definitions. But the kids on our team didn't want to do definitions. And she's like, well, then what are we going to debate? And so I think just the critical thinking factor that goes into this is so helpful for our kids. So like you said, learn how to really critically think through kind of things. So do you want to start with uh, with one of the pieces of the five common topics? I love, um, I love the first one because... The, if you only master one of the five, this one is the one to master, and that's define your terms. Right. <laughs> so whether you're talking um, in a personal relationship with another person, you're teaching your kids to have those social skills, um, or you're looking at an actual school subject, mm -hmm. or you're looking at a philosophy, yeah. a methodology, a worldview, it's so helpful. Actually, it's not just helpful, it's necessary to first define if you don't have common definitions or you don't have, we can use the same word yeah. and mean something totally different. So teaching our kids to clarify mm -hmm. by defining our terms, that one, that one alone will get you a long way. Right. Um, and that will help them as they go through anything they're trying to learn, mm -hmm. understand the vocabulary associated with the subject, mm -hmm. um, and then being able to apply that you know, that helps you just if the teacher says one thing and you think it means another, then you're all you're lost. OK, right. yeah. but in everyday communication, if we're talking and this is so easy to do, especially in our online world, yeah. it's so easy to miss each other. Yes. And so defining our terms about anything, um, it does. You know, you've ever heard, like, well, let's have a good, clean fight. Yeah. Well, we're not we're not really going to fight, but maybe. But it is the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> but in order to have a good clean fight or a, a good debate, you really do have to understand the terms. It's like a mutual agreement that these things mean this thing yeah. um, so that when you're moving through the rest of the five common topics, you start with an agreement or or disagreement, but you at least know what the terms are. Exactly. Right. Definition is so very important. I think it's it's kind of mushy in this day and age of postmodern cut and paste. Like mm -hmm. definitions are like, well, it's what I what my experience is. And 
and really it, it creating a definition that's external to the people um, just makes everything more objective. <laughs> It does. It does. Yes. Yeah. You you wouldn't want your doctor to not use that right. first. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and I don't think it just applies to the medical world. So. Right. Definitely. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So definition is so important and it, you can use this across subject matters. You can use it for history or theology or English or, um, uh, you know, I mean, just the whole distinctions in English between what is a verb and what is a gerund. Well, they, they take different actions in the sentence. So um, not everybody's going to do the deep dive to get to the point of gerund, but understanding what a verb does or doesn't do in a sentence can really help you communicate so much more easily and effectively. Yes. So, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, uh, well, and they, they don't really have to go in any particular order. You can use yeah. these for anything. Um, but the relationship one, and I always, I, I was really thinking about that before we got started this morning, the difference between relationship and circumstance, circumstance is another one of the five common topics, because I think they're easy to get a little confused. Um, mm -hmm. But relationship is who am I com to somebody else? So are Jean and I sisters or friends or coworkers? Um, and the relationship that we have to each other. And again, you can use that across subject matters, um, like you could use it for geography. What is Poland's relationship to Germany or what's mm -hmm. Mexico's relationship to Germany? Those yeah. those make big differences, right? Um, yeah. One is next door and one is across an ocean. So uh, circumstance, however, has to do with context. So this is one of the reasons I think every, every student needs to take world geography before they get into world history and U.S. history, because if you don't understand geography, which is the context, you're going to have a hard time understanding why, what was going on with Germany and Poland during World War II. <laughs> Even though they have this relationship to each other, what's the context and how does that all, how does that all matter? So con or circumstances, context, where, what, the time, all those kind of things where relationship is, how are we interacting and what what are we to each other and what are we not to each other? It's not just what we are, but what are we not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? I mean, you you have kind of like a different, like the principal approach is slightly different, not that much, but a little bit. <laughs> I think one of the um, hallmarks, and I was sitting here, the reason I was quiet is I was trying to think of where this fits into those five common topics, but you can help me with that. And that is seeing cause to effect, like what's the root cause of something Mm -hmm. versus the effect. Um, yeah. And that's that's key in teaching yeah. um, in the principal approach. And I think that has a role in the five common topics. If you understand relationship and circumstance, that's going to help you understand cause to effect. Yeah. So um, one of the examples that's often given is when <clears throat> the um, nation of Israel kept going back to Egypt mm -hmm. and it was, um, and then they wanted a king. You remember this whole yeah. story? Yep, yep. Well, why did they want a king? You know, it's like, well, be, was it because the other nations had kings? No, it was because of something in their own heart. That mm -hmm. was the root cause. So there's the lesson for us. Right, right. You know, why, are, why are we looking to other nations? So it was a heart issue. Mm -hmm. And if you can't place relationship to each other and circumstance. And um, then you might miss the cause to effect. And in the long run, cause to effect is what sticks with you. Like yeah. you, you can understand, you might not remember the names of the Kings or even it was Israel and who, I don't remember yeah. who <laughs> you, your kids will internalize, um, that they remember that they look to something outside themselves, mm -hmm. Israelites did, and your kids can relate to this. And so can we, right. to, to fill something that only God can, that yeah. that's basic principle. And so, yeah. um, that has a place in the common topics because it's a, it's a outer working of all those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yes. Together. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, and the cause to effect too. I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of stuck on world war II because I think it's such an, it's an obvious thing that we can look back on and look at objectively at this point a little bit, but what was the cause that, that just got under Germany's skin to make them want to be so military and, and to conquer different areas. I mean, if you go back to World War One, then you see, okay, well, what happened there that ended up in World War Two? You know, I mean, the cause effect is so very important. Yeah. Well, and if you look at, you were talking about circumstance and, um, oh my gosh, the other one just went out of my head. 
relationship, circumstance and relationship. If you think in the textbook, it just tells you tells you about um, Ferdinand, like that was the that was the key point. And so you can be led to believe that that event happened and it spiraled all these other things out of control. Yeah. But that's not really. Yeah. The big picture. That's not really what happened. Right. That's one piece. One little mm -hmm. piece. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did read about Ferdinand in eighth grade. <laughs> He was he was the catalyst for the whole rest of the next 20 years. That poor guy now like forever. Every school kid thinks that. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so for definition, relationship, circumstance. And this one is authority. And this one is so very important because who is the one um who do who do people refer back to as where they're getting their definitions or um, what is the authority in their life that gives them the impetus to go forward? And I think authority is so very important mm -hmm. um, because right now we hear a lot of kids talking about their, well, uh, people in general talking about their truth. In other words, their authority is themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's important to establish authority because, um, you know, one of the things I learned in, in teaching logic, which was, it's not my happy place. So when I say I taught logic, it wasn't like I got to teach logic. It was like, I taught logic. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> but if you're starting from your own primary, um, your, you're like it's your core belief and you keep referring back to that referentially, it's not circular reasoning. It's your core belief. And I think it's really important to understand that when we're talking to people, if it seems like they're using circular reasoning, you might want to ask some questions about is that, you know, to get to the fact, like, is that really their core belief or are they just blowing you off? Because um, circular reasoning is a great way to blow people off. Uh, mm -hmm. just, just in the, that was like <clears throat> really logic mumbo jumbo. So I'm sure somebody else could explain it way better than I just did. But I think it's an important point because, um, you know, people do, their core beliefs are really important to them. That's why they're core mm -hmm. to them and they're not going to give them up easily. <laughs> Yeah. I, and I, when we talk about authority um, and we talk about your truth, my truth, the truth, there's a truth there. And we're all kind of um, if we're we, back again, going back to definitions, what do we establish as truth? What is the barometer we're going to use or the metric or the foundation that how we're going to define truth? Yes. Um, and that core belief, you know, with your kids, you're helping them form their core beliefs and then as they get to be teenagers and they go through ideation and they're trying to be their own person, yeah, you can just count on they're going to take some of your core belief and some of the things they believe and have reasoned through, hopefully, mm -hmm. and they're going to have a new core belief. Yeah. But hopefully, prayerfully, you're that those core, some of those core beliefs that mean the most to you, like if you rank them, wow. those when we talk about at true north, when we talk about a transmission of culture, mm -hmm. these are the kind of things that we're trying to transmit mm -hmm. those, those strong core beliefs um, that have a, are based on a moral compass. And that moral compass, of course, um, hopefully is based on God's word or what the, God has to say to us. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think that's important. Right. Exactly. And um, you might have different core beliefs about different things. I mean, your core beliefs about food might be informed by nutrition or a medical issue that you have, or it, it might be like based on um, on your faith or religion. You know, the kosher laws are based on on a, a faith system, but they also get back to health things, too. So it just depends on what you're talking about, if it's if it's yeah you know, whatever subject, but authority is great to talk about when you're doing um, subjects, because things like math, if kids say, oh, well, I don't see why two plus two has to, has to equal four. It's a simple matter of authority. These are the math rules and laws. The, yeah. the end. <laughs> uh, we don't get our truth in math. It's just what it is. It's fact-based. And so um, I think that's really helpful for kids sometimes when they're, they're just really struggling with a concept. Help them go back to the authority of the concept and mm -hmm. where is it coming from? Um, and, and that might be a great conversation to have with them. The one thing I want to point out with all of these, they are great conversation starters with your kids. And I know um, as our kids get older, it might be more complicated and, um, 
and struggling. It might be a struggle to have those conversations with your kids. But if you just go back to these things, even if you're watching a movie together, you could even just have these conversations about the movie that you watched. Like, well, let's define what we were talking about or, you know, what is the relationship to this person to that person? And yep. it's not an emotional conversation, but you get you get some great thoughts and ideas as a result of these kind of questions. I think that's a good point that you make. It's not an emotional conversation because yeah. it's really easy to do when our kids um, start growing up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you're, you're almost looking at another adult. They're not, yeah. maybe, may, maybe they're 16, 17 years old, or in my case, maybe they're in their twenties mm -hmm. and you're having conversations and they, they're, they, we talked about those core beliefs. Mm -hmm. If you can, you can actually learn something from one another. If you can set aside the emotional aspect of the conversation and just know they are not going to believe everything you believe exactly mm -hmm. to the letter all down the line, because do you, I mean, if you look at your own parents, yeah, you can see this certain shifts, but if you talk about, um, if you can talk about things and leave some emotion out of it, not get worked up, it does leave the door for communication open. And if you can apply these five common topics, so you're at least working together on commonalities and, def, you know, the same authorities. Yeah, exactly. And I think homeschooling is a great way to raise your kids. It's a great way to educate your kids. But let's be honest, like it's, it's not always easy. You still have the same kind of struggles in, in relationships that you do, whether your kids are at home or at school or at private school, because people are people and your kids are going through developmental tasks. And by the way, you are too, at the same time your kids are. And I think that's like kind of an under discussed thing with homeschooling parents and, and just parents in general, like our kids are going through these stages and ages, but as adults, we are too. And sometimes those ages and stages really butt heads together. <laughs> You do. And you're not the same parent to your first one as you are to your third one. Oh my right. God. <laughs> right. I always think, oh, that first one is a guinea pig. No kidding. No they kidding. Are. You yeah. are learning. You've read all the books and the, you know, you can see every kind of funny meme in the world on the internet about it, but it's really true. And yeah. so, yeah, that's it a is. lot of what you just shared. Yeah. It is. Sure. it is. So my youngest daughter, who is in so many ways more like a firstborn because of because of age, you know, the age between kids and we had a, a boy before her and then she's a girl. We we were having lunch and she just looks at me and she goes, you're such a middleborn and I'm such a firstborn. And it's so true. Like even, even across generations, like those, those things do kind of hold true a little bit. They do. They do. I have a, I'm a oldest, I'm a firstborn. And then I have my son, he's my oldest. And then we didn't, ha we didn't have um, my first daughter and f there's a four year gap, a little over four. And so I always feel like I have two firstborns. Yes. And then, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. there's we a have baby in the family. You have a definite baby in the family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone would agree in our family who the baby is. <laughs> they would. We have, well, I don't know. It's kind of confusing in our family. We have five kids, but there's three to five years between each one. And then it goes two girls with a, with a four-year gap and then a boy with a four-year gap and then a boy with a five and a half year gap and then a girl. So it's like, I think we have five firstborns. I mean, I think really seriously, like everybody was opinionated in my household. <laughs> That's, hilarious. <clears throat> That's hilarious. And here you are. Is your husband a firstborn? He's a second born, but his, his older sister had a lot of physical problems. So he co-opted that spot in many ways. Right. And actually so did my, my sister did too in high school. And so I, we're second borns with firstborn issues. <laughs> Those things are so fun to look at. Yeah. Here we are. We're talking about five common topics. Seriously. <laughs> it works. It works. It's how it will just say, we'll, we'll connect it this way. This is how the different, where you're born in your family, your birth order affects how you approach those five common topics. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. It's so true. Um, I think the last one we're going to talk about is my favorite and this is compare and contrast. And I love this. I love comparing and contrasting. It's something I do naturally. I don't, I don't know that everybody does, but um, I used to say I had the gift of criticism to kind of take the edge off of it, which I know it's not a spiritual gift. So if, so I've been told that it's not. I do know that. <laughs> but I, I think that's part of what makes me really good at editing things and concept editing is because I, I look at this and go, well, it's not that, but it could be this. But comparing and contrasting can be such a great educational tool. Mm -hmm. um, 
Compare and contrast Germany at the turn of the 19th century versus 1925 after the First World War and 1945 after the second. I mean, there are some sharp and clear differences. And then you can get back to like what was what was the the cause of that, um, all those kind of things. But comparing and contrasting can be so helpful, even like just comparing one piece of literature to another. Um, my daughter decided to read a bunch of dystopian literature this this summer. So she was comparing Animal Farm to 1984, which is so fascinating. Um, but you can do it across subjects, um, yeah. geography, history, English, um, science, even foreign languages. It's such a fun way to look at things and get to the nuances of different issues. Yeah, we used a fun tool um, and it was actually, I didn't create this tool, but it was created by um, the late Mr. James Rose, and he called it take tea, like, you know, teacup, take tea yeah. and see. And you, you probably can't see my tea chart, but oh, <clears> nice. yeah. you make a tea chart and you put like you put Animal Farm on one side, mm -hmm. 1984 on the other. And you yeah. just you can do you can use that for a compare contrast, but you can use that yeah. <clears throat> tea chart anytime for a compare contrast. Yeah, so helpful. We learned in Lost Tools of Writing to make an Annie chart. So you put the affirmatives on one side, the negatives in, the, in another column, and then interesting facts in a third column. Um, and I found that to be really a great critical thinking tool as well, especially if you assign the kids. Like you have to come up with 15 to 30 things in each column because then they start comparing and contrasting. They start looking at relationships and circumstances. If you just put the first five down, that's easy. Anybody can come up with, with five affirmatives or negatives. But when you start saying 15 to 20 to 30, you have to really start thinking very creatively about the problems and doing some critical thinking. And it, it is actually a difficult task. I, um, I did this with junior hires. And uh, we actually had to do it together several times because it really causes the kids to think about the issues of the of the we were doing literature about the piece of work, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like the T chart, and then you just add an interesting column, and that's a great way to think creatively about the about the situations too. But I love comparing and contrasting. If a parent wanted to get started with this, okay, maybe they're coming from they've been using. Maybe they're still using textbooks or workbooks or um, they're using some free online stuff that's, you know, printables driven or whatever. Um, <laughs> how could you get started with the five common topics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have an ebook at True North Home School Academy. And actually, my 23 year old son and I wrote it together several years ago. He's taught at True North for he taught Latin and he's doing Old Testament, New Testament this year. But we actually have a unit study in there on, based on the trebuchet. Um, he's a big uh, war uh, military expert kind of guy. Like he loves history and he knows a lot about mm -hmm. it. So we took the trebuchet and um, there's there's graphics in there. Um, and we just went through the definition of a, of a trebuchet, the relationship of a trebuchet to other medieval weapons of war, um, who started the trebuchet, why was it started, comparing and contrasting it to ancient types of warfare uh, or war mechanisms. I guess it's a machine, right? Like, <laughs> yes, it is a machine <laughs> and current ones. And then where and when would it be used? And um, there's other examples too. We do one for geography and all that kind of stuff. But I would say, honestly, if you don't want to get the ebook, that's fine. But start with definition because definition is so, so great. And it's simple because you can, you can literally Google the definition or just get your dictionary out and, and define terms. And that's a great way to just start critically thinking about anything that you're studying. And I mean, printables and, and textbooks are great. I think they're a great starting place. If you feel like you don't want to, you don't want to put it all together yourself, or you just want to, you just want to know that it's all done there for you. But I would say the thing about textbooks that I think is limited is they don't go too deep into the five common topics. They're mm -hmm. telling the student what to think about a situation. That's why we all know King Ferdinand, right? Because we read right. it in a textbook and we're like, well, King Ferdinand, he was the problem. <laughs> he was the troublemaker. <laughs> Answer, check plus. Yes. Exactly, right? And then we all got our A. So I think even just if you start with King Ferdinand, that's great. Define who King Ferdinand was. Just go look him up. And what does a king mean? Um, what did his name mean? And then you can go into his relationship to the rest of Europe. Um, at, by whose authority was he made king? What is the authority of a king? All those kind of things. Definition is a great place to start, I think. 
Well, I love the five common topics and I'll tell you it really, it can open up <clears throat> learning for your kids. Yeah. So rather than, you know, in the classical model, you have that whole parrot stage in the beginning, yeah. but the key here is it's in the beginning right. and I think in <laughs> some more modern educational models, we take that for the whole 12 years ish right. that they're in school. Um, and if they, we can ask them a question and they can give us King Ferdinand as the answer. We assume they understand. Yes. But if they know, they might know something, know a fact, but it's what we do with the facts that we learn. And the five common topics open up, open up, will open up the facts yeah. and it will help them to um, develop a love of learning. So yeah. using, using these, I think is important. I, you know, are our kids able to even question who King Ferdinand is? Right. Like yeah. they, they think to ask that even if you yeah. if you can say I don't even know if I would ask that then maybe start the five common topics with yourself yeah and get in the practice of some of these of one of the you know of the five elements and you can start I mean you can use it in Bible study you can use it in a book you're reading whatever but yeah. um, internalize it yourself it's much easier than to transmit it to your kids yeah. and then you're modeling it but yes um, just the way it opens up wow. so. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have conversations. We still have conversations based on the co five common topics. And I mean, we we really formalized it when my kids were in junior high. We had we had laminated charts on the wall <laughs> because mm -hmm. it just felt like such an important tool. And that's the one thing I want to encourage you if you're homeschooling for the first time or even after you've done it for years and years, give your kids um, skills and tools to study with. I mean, study skills are so important and mm -hmm. the five common topics are great study skills that they can take with them to college, to Votech training, um, to their marriage and relationships, because really understanding five common topics as you're having discussions with the people you love most can be super helpful. You guys might be in a big fight thinking you all are talking about the same thing. And if you just get back to definition, you might realize you are really talking past each other. And that yeah. seems like I know we're probably the only people who've ever had heated arguments in the world, but <laughs> it, it can really help diffuse situations. Just go back and say, no, I was actually talking about this. Uh, oh, OK. Well, yeah. Well, we don't need to argue anymore. <laughs> it can be so simple. Um, so I would say really give your kids study skills. And this is a really good basic one. You can use it for anything. You can create your own unit studies with it. Just pick a topic your kids love and do the five common topics with them. You could do you could do it in a day or you could do it over the course of a, a week or months or even years. I mean, we have some things that we're still studying in our home. And even though we don't have kids living with us anymore, we still have discussions on the phone about them because they're still an important, mm -hmm. exciting course of study for all of us, you know? So sure. yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. I know you guys you guys have the same kind of relationships with your kids too. And and I did say at the beginning, like you did have four kids, but now you have five. So um congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you. I did not birth another baby. So just so everybody's clear and told for that. Um, but no, I have a stepdaughter now and she's um fortunately she actually is she's gonna go on to law school someday. So she already Learning the definitions would be a good th thing because she's at that uh, stage where, oh, uh, you know, debate would be great for her. If she were in a debate class and she got it out at, at school, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she has, that, and I, you know, I know I have uh, the other four. Naturally, I have some that are more. Um, yeah, they would love to debate things, and that's great because their dad is like that too. So yeah, but. but I will say equipping your kids with the, with this uh, method or if it's a method, just a tool. Um, but uh, when my oldest went off to college, um, he came home. And one of the things he said to me was, you know, he could he couldn't there was there was no one else to have the great conversation with. And back when I was homeschooling, training your kids to have the great conversation yes. um, based on the great book series and when the classical model was really first just making headway into the homeschool world um he was so sharp that that's what i wanted for him well but when he got there it's like what your daughter was experiencing just like who am i going to talk about these things with because they weren't equipped with the five common topics they don't know how to approach them but they're easy to learn and easy to pick up they so. are they are i think right now the kids it seems like that i've had experienced that have gone through public school for a very long time that have been really good students, 
they they get the know they get the information and they're able to give it back on a test, but they haven't thought deeply necessarily about the information. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a thinking tool, and you can use it for anything. You can apply it to the curriculum that you're using. You can make your own curriculum from it. Um, it's just such a great tool to have for life, and your kids will probably refer to it for the rest of their life once they learn it. I know I have. I I think about it all the time, just as far as even. Um, how we set up our program at True North and what we're doing in different different pieces that not that hard. So um, we'll link the the booklet if you want to purchase it. It's just five common topics, not so common anymore, which <laughs> is it's probably too cheesy of a title, but there you have it. Um, so you guys, thanks for listening, Gina. Thanks for chatting with me this morning. Yes, so much fun. Guys, we'll never do a fifteen minute live. Sorry. I know, I know. We were like, let's just hop on for 10 or 15 minutes because we started to, okay, so how do we start this whole conversation? We were talking the other day about some things coming up for Christmas and we've got some great stuff planned. Um, and we started talking about like critical thinking and our kids really needing tools for critical thinking. And honestly, this is such a great simple tool. It doesn't cost you any money to teach your kids critical thinking skills. And they need them because they have so much coming at them yeah. right now with social media and um, propaganda versus news, all those kind of things. So this yeah. will help them sort all those things out. Yes. Urgent, really. Urgent. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, okay. Well, thanks, you guys. We will talk to you all soon. And let us know if you have any questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you. Yeah.